Hi everyone. Uh, I'm Puya. I'm going to be talking about the computa computational models of vision. So we're doing this together with Ko Carr, which is who's going to do the second half. Uh, so the first half is going to be about the encoding model. That is the, basically the encoding model, uh, encoding part of the computational models of vision and the decoding part, which Ko is going to talk about. So I'm a postdoc at Jim DeCarlo's lab and we do computational modeling of vision. So the, the way I thought about this, uh, the, the, the topics that I'm going to talk about tonight is, is I group them into three parts. The first part is uh, basically the motivation, why we're studying vision. The second part is uh, kind of like a background about what we know about vision, vision and primate vision mostly. Um, and the, the third part is about the models that we already have for these processes and then we're going to end it with some uh, applications of these models in neuroscience. So while I was preparing these slides, I was thinking whether I should talk about models first or vision first. I finally decided that it's best to talk about models, why, why we are t interested about models at all. So there are two questions, why do we need models? And then the second question, which is probably related and even more important is that how can we use these models in science? So the way that we should be thinking about models is as models as modern hypotheses. So basically we, we build a model as our hypothesis and then we, this model give us uh, a, false, a set of falsifiable predictions which are very important for the, for the progress in science because once we, ha we, we can make some predictions that we can test them and uh, we get some success and we, more importantly, we get some errors. And then once we make some errors in our predictions, we can use those errors to fix or reinvent our models. And then what we can do is basically go back to the first step and keep doing this loop until we, we get to the best model that we can have, which is, which is the closest thing you can have to the truth that you're looking for. So going back to the second question, why vision? Um, I think many of you would agree that uh, vision or maybe any part of the cortex, the, what, the reason why we're, we're really studying them is that each of these region, regions in the cortex, or maybe mostly vision, is a window into how neural networks build a compact representation of the world. And that's basically our attempt to understand how brain learns and how brain is doing all the interesting and amazing things that it's doing. So in order to get there, we need to, we need to answer a couple of different questions. First of all is how the encoded image, for example, in the vision case, how the encoded image is represented by the neural responses within the peripheral and uh, the early cortical visual pathways. And the second thing is what's the role of these representations in efficient image coding and maybe how we get from those uh, efficient image coding to behavior, which is mostly going to be uh, the topic of what Ko is going to talk about later. So this section is basically about what we know about the vision. I'm sure most of, two, most of you, maybe all of you were today, were at Nico's presentation this afternoon. So I'm going to be talking about this pretty quickly because you already know most of it, at least for V1, V2. So um, vision in, a primate, in the primate cortex is made out of two main uh, visual streams, which are called what and where streams or ventral or dorsal streams. So each one of these streams are actually are, are mostly thought of as doing a rather different thing. For example, ventral stream is mostly about uh, figuring out the color, the texture, the shape, the size, and the, 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 the dorsal stream is mostly thought of as uh, the mechanism to, to figure out the location and the movement and so on. So I'm going to be talking about the ventral stream mostly today, or oh, not mostly, all of it. Uh, which is made out of a series of regions that starts from the retina and then ends in at an area which we call it a IT, inferior temporal cortex. Also, this is not really the end of the ventral stream because from the IT there are projections that would go to prefrontal cortex, but for now, for this session, we, we're going to be mostly think, thinking and uh, talking about these set of areas. So starting from the retina, the retina is where the light is actually transformed to electric signals. And from there, it's, it's propagated to a series of different areas that are 
that build a, a set of representations that give us um, an efficient coding of the image, which are which is basically made out of light projections from any object in the world, right? So the way it's done is that through, a couple, uh, through mo mainly two different types of sensors, the cones and rods, which basically absorb the light and make electric signals. And then there are two other layers or two other different types of uh, cells in the retina uh, that um, receive input from rods and cones and then transform them in some ways. And then the, the last layer is actually the, the ganglion cells, retinal ganglion cells which project uh, the signal out of the retina and into uh, the, the LGN, which is the next region. So knowing, knowing about the quality of the sensors, there are some facts about the, how good the, these sensors, the rods and cones are. Basically, these sensors, they, they, there, there, is a there is only a narrow region of high visual acuity in the, in the retina, which is on the fovea here, which is very narrow. And on top of that, the, these sensors, they have a very uh, small dynamic range. And the representation of wave, wavelengths is actually very coarse. Yeah. So if, if this was, yeah. Yeah, actually a question, because I heard from somewhere that the dynamic range can actually be pretty great. On the cones and rods, or like in general, for the visual? I guess just in general, like for things that you can see, maybe given like some temporal time of adaptation, you can adapt to like that. Like yeah, what I'm, what I'm talking about here is mostly this part only, only the rods and cones. Right, but if your sensor is saturated, I don't think our offspring can extract any useful So that's the, that's the beauty of it. So the limitation that you have in the sensor is somewhat compensated by the whole system, the visual system, so that the downstream areas compensate for the, these weaknesses, right? Partly because like, the contrast is the, the piece of information that is being propagated up, right? It's not the, the luminance level, for example. So if you think of this as a camera, then this, this camera would probably not be a camera that you want to spend your money on. So the next area is actually lateral geniculate nucleus, which is kind of a, um, an area in between the retina and the, the cortex. And uh, so there are two streams being uh, partially starting from the retina that has uh, two different uh, properties. One of them is, uh, is a high spatial frequency and low temporal frequency, which is called paracellular stream. And the other one is called magnocellular, which is the, in the inverse of the other, the other stream. So uh, the projections of the retina go to LGN. And from here, they are projected to the first cortical area, which is V1, which we're going to talk about next. So this is uh, one of the the oldest part of the cortex that has been studied. So the neurons in the area V1 are um, orientation selective. And there are two types of neurons in, uh, in V1 uh, that are called simple, simple cells and complex cells. So both of these neurons are orientation selective, but the complex neurons are actually, um, they pull over a couple of simple cells. So their, their inputs are coming from simple cells and therefore they have uh, they, they have orientation selectivity and also some uh, invariance to the position of the input coming in. And one interesting fact about area V1 is the, the topographical map of the, the feature detectors. The, in here, what you're, saying, what you're seeing here is that uh, the colors are actually coding the, the orientation angle of the feature detectors in each part of the cortex. And as you can see, there is uh, if you look at this point, there are points that are called pinwheels that all around them, the feature detectors respond to different orientation of different angles. And that, that's interesting in a sense that it gives us some, some intuition about how maybe learning and how uh, this, the brain as a whole is learning different representations from the input. The next area is V2, which is mostly believed to be, uh, the, the neurons in area V2 are mostly believed to be responding to um, basically patterns, uh, the correlation of patterns in V1 neurons. So they receive their inputs from V1. And uh, the interpretation for V2 neurons is that they do some kind of AND-like operator on V1 outputs, and that's what generates their output. So in here, I'm, I'm showing a, an experiment done by Freeman and all, Freeman and collaborators. So what they did was that they, they had a, a set of uh, original texture figures, 
And what they did was that they synthesized two versions of these textures. One was uh, basically noise images that had matched spectral characteristics. And the other one was, uh, was uh, basically a synthetic image that was generated to, to match the correlation between V1-like uh, cells outputs. And when they showed this to monkeys, what they found was that V1 neurons would respond the same to both of these group of uh, stimuli, but V2 neurons would actually respond higher to this set of stimuli and less to this one. This is basically confirming the hypothesis. So next is area V4, which uh, I'm sure by now you're getting the, they're getting the flow of things. Basically, as we go deeper, the, the kind of stimuli that neurons in each area respond to are becoming more and more complex. For example, here in area V4, these are two example neurons. And the color is basically showing the, the, the normalized firing rates of these neurons to this, these different patterns. As, as you can see, for, for each neuron, they're responding to very complex and specific at the same time uh, patterns of inputs. And another thing that you might notice is that as we're going deeper, the receptive field of these neurons, which is basically the part of the visual field that they respond to, is increasing as we're going deeper. And uh, so this is a summary of what we have seen so far. So V1 encoded edges, V2 kind of encoded texture-like inputs, and V4 is encoding more complex gratings. So in a sense, we can say that the, the ventral stream is capturing visual regularity, regularities of increasing complexity. But the question here is that are these regularities tuned to behavior or not? So I don't have an answer here, but later on in one of the slides, we go back to this question and see what we know about this. So, um, so the final area that we're going to talk about is the IT area, inferior temporal cortex. So as you can imagine, in this area, the, the kind of stimuli that uh, excite neurons are becoming even more complex and more object-like. For example, in this figure, you see that uh, this particular neuron is responding to hands at different, basically different versions of the hand, the flipped hand, the left hand, right hand, and even some, some object-like uh, patterns that are kind of similar to hand, but not exactly, and scaled versions. But for example, it does not uh, respond to faces or forks. And there's been some, some studies that showing that these kind of object-like uh, ideas that we think the neurons are responding to may be reduced to more simpler and more abstract kind of patterns that the same neuron still responds to. And also, uh, there's been some attempt to, to basically try to discover the kind of optimal stimuli for the neurons in these this area. But the fact is that, that I want you to pay attention to is that as we're going deeper into the visual cortex, it's becoming uh, harder and harder to actually discover these kind of optimal stimuli because the space of possibilities are becoming larger and, and larger, right? So getting into models of vision now. So again, we start from the retina. Retina was the first part. So we have a range of different uh, possible models. Uh, going from spike-triggered averaging, which basically looks at the, for each neuron, it looks at the patterns of input that occurred before a neuron, a specific neuron, is firing. And then averaging out over all of the uh, stimuli that uh, caused, uh, that caused a, a spike on the neuron, and then getting, to, getting into like a spike-triggered average, which is the average, res average stimuli that uh, generated a spike on the neuron. And we have linear nonlinear methods, which are made out of uh, a linear transformation followed by a nonlinearity. And then we have some more recent work, which are, which are basically convolutional models. For example, this particular model is made, made out of two, uh, two layers of convolution plus, plus nonlinearity and one dense layer plus nonlinearity. And the way this, this network is trained, so each of, each of these layers actually have some parameters that need to be tuned, right? So the way these models are, uh, are, are the, the parameters of these models are found is by showing the images that has been shown to the, to the animal and then train them by reducing the error in predicting the, the neural responses in the retina. And it's been shown that these kind of models are doing much better than the previous more classic uh, models of the retina. This is something that we will be seeing in the, the next slides. And this is kind of 
maybe eye-opening that most of the most of the models that we have right now the best models that we have right now they have they're following these specific rules or they're ma made out of these blocks which are basically convolution normalization and some simple nonlinearities. so uh, going to next area v1 which is basically the models here are very similar to what we had for the retina maybe this one no <laughs> So the, the classic model that we have for V1 is basically a uh, bank of Gabor filters or wavelet transforms, which look like uh, gratings or Gabor filters that, are, that have different orientations and different spatial frequencies. Again, here we have a set of models which are within the class of CNNs. But the difference between this CNN that you see here and the, the previous one for the retina is that for this case, this is a this is basically a larger uh, CNN model that is not trained to predict the neural activity, but this model is trained to, for object categorization on a larger data set. And it's been shown that the earlier layers of such network would be a good predictor of V1 cell activities. And here again, as we can see, the CNN models, the CNN and the VGG, are, are performing better than the classic models that we had for the neurons in this area again. Um, so we have, we have also models of V2. One specific model is the HMAX model, which again is made out of convolution and uh, uh, nonlinearity and normalization. So in this model, some of, the, some of the parameters were actually fixed, but some of them were trainable using a task. So it's not a complete fixed model. And also, the Gabriel Kreiman was also an a co-author on this paper. I don't know if he's here now. So, so, so far we've seen that for most of these areas that we looked at, maybe all of them, we, have, we now have a convolutional model that is doing better than the previous ones, right? So let's, let's dig deeper into these models before going to other areas like V4 and IT. So one example of these models, maybe the first one that actually worked on a, on a big problem in the computer vision was the, a model called later on AlexNet which was proposed by Krzyzewski and Jeff, Jeff Hinton. So this model was made out of a stack of convolutions and pooling layers, plus some nonlinearities and normalization, like many of the other models that we saw before. So this, this model was, the parameters of this model were optimized on a, on a data set of 1.3 million labeled images. And the task that was the, the, the parameters were optimized for was the, basically to reduce the object classification error on this data set. And what was shown was that the, the, the kind of feature detectors in the first layer were very similar to the things that people had in mind as what the V1, the maybe V2 cells are doing in the brain. So how do we use these models to, in neuroscience, basically? So we have a convolutional model up here that is trained to, to detect the, opt or to, to categorize the, the the main object in an image, right? And we have a brain here that we can plant some electrodes on it and then we can record the response of neurons in, in response to some images. So what we do is that we show the same image to both the model and the brain and we get the features from the model which are basically the outputs of convolutional layers and then non after nonlinearities, before nonlinearities, wherever you want it to. And then, uh, we also, at the same time, we're recording from the monkey brain. So we have a set of features, and we have a set of response variables. So we can actually regress from the features to these rep response variables to make a complete predictive model that goes from the pixels to actual neurons activities. Right? So we can do this for different areas and different feature sets. Right? So when we do this, it's been shown that the, the features in the in the higher layers of this, deeper layers of these networks are actually predictive of neurons in IT and, and V4. Oh, I mistyped here. This is V4. And another interesting fact is that uh, why the last layer here, this was a four-layer convolutional model that was tried here. The interesting fact was that the last layer here was the best predictor of IT, and the middle ones, the intermediate layers, were better predictors of V4 neurons. So it's kind of the, the sequence of uh, regions are still preserved in these kind of networks. And uh, between 50 to 60% of the explainable variance uh, in V4 and IT neuron responses 
was explained by this model, for example. Right now, we're maybe a little higher than these numbers, about maybe 60 to, to 70, depending on which model you're looking at. Another way that we can, we can compare these features between the models and the brain is uh, to see how the responses of activity, the, basically the response of the population differs when you compare an image to another image, response to one image to another image, or response to one object to another object, or maybe one category of objects as a whole to another category. So these comparisons are made between these kind of matrices, which is encoding the, the dissimilarity between the responses and a set of features. The set of features could be the neural activity, in this case, for example, for IT neurons, or for the convolutional model, which is called HMO here. As you can see, I'm, I'm sure you can appreciate how similar these two patterns are, which is basically encoding the dissimilarity in population responses between the two. So going back to the question that I asked earlier, are these regularities related to behavior or not? I don't have a definite answer, but what we can say from previous study in our lab is that the behavioral performance and the similarity in representations between brain and these models are correlated. So finishing with the models, going to the applications. So the first set of applications that we can think of is in automation, basically in industrial automation. So we can do a lot of things with a good vision model. We can do face recognition. We can, we can build self-driving cars. We can, we can use them in security and many forms of different intelligence. Basically, vision is necessary to make sense of the visual world. And that's a, an, an essential part of every intelligent agent, right? But what about in neuroscience? So the first application that we can think of is to basically build predictive model of neurons what we discussed before, right? In this figure, what I'm showing here is that we have the actual neuron responses as black and we have the predictive responses from the convolutional network. And this part is basically response to different images of category chair, for example. As you can see, it does not exactly predict all the responses to all the different images, but to a good number of images at least, the, the response, the predicted responses are very close to actual responses. And you can then change category to some other category and you see that the same thing happened. And of course, all of these predictions were made on uh, a set of images that were not used during the training of the model or the mapping, right? Because that's essential. Another application that we can think of is the control, what we call neural population control. So as we talked about the model before, we first build a model and then we can make a regression going from the model to our neural responses. Now we have a forward model that goes from pixels to actual neural responses, right? Once we have this model, and you should, you should know that these predictions are, as we discussed before, they're correlated, the predicted responses are very much correlated with the actual firing rates, right? But what we can do further is that now we have a differentiable model that goes from pixels to actual responses. We can use it in the backward path, basically. We can use them to now put the, mo put the population of responses into any desired state. For example, two cases that we thought of was, uh, was to whether we can use this model now to generate some image that would um, drive the neuron beyond whatever firing rate we've observed so far. We're calling that stretch maximal drive. Another regime that we thought of was what we called one hot population in which not only we want to push up or drive one neuron, we want to also keep the other neurons from firing. So we want to inhibit every neuron except one, which we're driving up. And we do this and um, what happens is we can generate now, we can generate images for each neuron in whatever area we're recording from. So this, these results that I'm showing you are unpublished work on, uh, on neurons in area V4. So we generate the images, and um, before I show you that what happens when we show those images to the animals, um, here's what we had before. Basically a set of naturalistic images that we showed to the animal, and we got the predicted responses from the model and the actual firing rate, and we see that they're pretty correlated. And we can look at the, the best image that excited that particular neuron, which is this image. And this red circle is showing the receptive field of that particular neuron. And here it's the zoomed in version of what's 
what's inside the receptive field of that particular neuron. This is the, this is the pattern, basically, that maximally activated that neuron. Once we show those synthetic images and we, we plot those uh, responses against these naturalistic images, we see that the, the model is actually completely uh, pushing the neuron outside its normal range and generating, basically generating an opt close to optimal stimuli for, stimulus for that particular neuron. So how do these stimuli look like? So we did this procedure using five different random seeds. And uh, you can see how each of these patterns look like. So although they're dissimilar from each other, but they also look perceptually the same. So the second version that we, we tried was what we called the one-hot population. Here, what I'm showing here is the responses of two example neurons, right? The top row for each neuron is uh, what happens, like how each of these neurons, which are basically a total of 50 neurons, how each one of these neurons are responding to this pattern that was uh, basically generated to drive this particular neuron up. And as you can see, as we're pushing this particular neuron up, we're also pushing the other neurons up. So it's not really selective for an individual neuron. But once we change the loss function and include the other measurements that we had, basically to drive every other neuron down and only keep this one up, we get a much better or at least closer to the desired pattern that we were looking for. It becomes much more sparse, right? And this happens for like, different, mod different example neurons that we tried. Another interesting fact is that as we do these two different kind of optimizations, it's interesting to look at some of these patterns that are the outcome of this kind of optimization. So for example, if you compare these two, they're not, they're kind of dissimilar, but also they have some similarities. Maybe the luminance level is also lower than this when we did the optimization to, when we considered all the neurons in our optimization to drive them down. So this would be basically a better, a, a closer stimulus to the optimal stimulus of that particular neuron, right? So here is another application and I think that's it.